it's really hard to imagine how traumatic it would have been for the religious leaders of Israel, the scribes, the rabbis, the teachers of the law, the priestly professionals and the Levites who served in the temple offering sacrifices, the hyper-pious lay people, the, the Pharisees who believed that they were somehow being made holy, if not holier than others, by following the minutia of the law. It would be hard to imagine how traumatic it would have been for the religious leaders of Israel to hear about a new covenant and to be told that the former regulation is set aside. The word means annulled. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless. Can you imagine how you'd feel if somebody told you that everything that you had built your life on was ultimately uh, null and void because it was weak and useless? But that is precisely what the author of Hebrews is announcing in today's text. He just comes right out and says it. He doesn't mince words. It's not, you know, spoken in some kind of vague way. He says it's weak and, and useless. That was a really dangerous thing to say. We forget that the Bible, the New Testament, is a really dangerous book. When a deacon in the early church by the name of Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin, it was a 70-some uh, member group of uh, of religious leaders who were responsible for kind of the oversight of the community of faith. When this guy Stephen is brought before the Sanhedrin by a group of his opponents, what crime do they accuse him of? They say he never stopped speaking against this holy place, the temple. He never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. In the end, Stephen is put to death by an angry crowd. He becomes the first Christian martyr. And the accusation against him was basically that he too was saying that the law was weak and useless. This weekend, as we've said, we're concluding our better series by turning to the New Testament book of Hebrews. Now, the New Testament book of Hebrews was almost certainly written before 70 AD. We know that because the temple that was in Jerusalem was torn down by the Romans in 70 AD. And if it had been written after that, the author surely would have mentioned it. One of the things that's fascinating about the book of Hebrews is that it uses the word better more than any other book in the New Testament. For instance, it says, in Christ we have a better covenant with better promises, a better sacrifice, a better resurrection, a better hope. A dozen times he uses the word better, which makes you wonder as you read how much better Christ is, what was wrong with the old system? Why would somebody say that it's a null? Why would they say, if God had given it, why would they say it was weak and useless? Why is Jesus so much better? Now, remember the point of the law. As, as Christians, sometimes we're tempted to think that the law was, was a bad thing. It wasn't. The Old Testament law was originally understood to be given by God to guide the people of Israel in their calling to be a holy people set apart. They weren't supposed to look like everybody else. They were supposed to do things different. And why were they to be a holy people set apart? Because they had this special calling. Their calling was that they would be the nation through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. And so they needed to continue their existence in a unique way. That's why God wanted them to be different, a holy people set apart. But over time, the way the law began to, to become interpreted was, was really misunderstood and it was misused. The thing is, the problem was not with the law itself. The problem was, and really it remains, the problem is the human heart. Because of sin, because of our separation from God, because of this belief that we're kind of the center of the universe and so on, because of sin, there is a danger that is inherent in all rule-based religion. 
And we see a perfect example of rule-based religion in, of, of course, um, the, the law, the Torah, that we read about in the Old Testament. It can, if we are not careful, rule-based religion can lead to legalism, to perfectionism, and that will make you neurotic and crazy. It will lead to pride on the one hand. Why pride? When we start comparing ourselves to other people and how we measure up to the law, it's sort of like, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing it better than they are. I understand it better than they do. This is what pride does. It, you know, it, it, it leads us to believe that somehow we have more insight than those around us or that we're somehow better than others. That's the one hand. It can lead to pride. On the other hand, it can lead to an incredible sense of inadequacy and shame and guilt if we compare ourselves to others and go, or compare ourselves to the law and go, man, I suck. I can't do any of this stuff. I, I try, and no matter what happens, I'm just not good enough. That can lead to a broken spirit. Or, on the opposite, it could lead to a critical spirit. It can lead to anxiety, hypocrisy, religious posturing, and pretense. I'll tell you something. If you're living under the burden of rule-based religion, something else that it can lead to is anger. Because you will be constantly frustrated. Because you can never be good enough. It can lead to a host of other spiritual ills, too. I don't want to spend all my time talking about it, but this is, these are some of the ways that, you know, when we misappropriate God's will for our lives, that, that can happen. Whatever form it takes, it is what happens to the human heart when we believe, listen to this, when we believe that our value or anybody else's value worth, their significance, or their salvation is based on performance. That way of life is emotionally and spiritually exhausting. It is futile. It will never work. But most of all, and the point I want to make today is, it's not of God. It's not of God. The author of Hebrews wants us to know that Jesus offers something better. In uh, the New Testament uh, period, the, um, the word yoke was used to describe the law, the yoke of the law. And we know by tradition that, uh, that Jesus was a carpenter, a carpenter's son. It's extra biblical tradition, but it's pretty well established. Um, so given the fact that the yoke of the law is uh, the Torah, the Old Testament, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. You're just tired from this and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, this is what Jesus offers us. It's rest for our souls. If, if you are tired of feeling like you have to prove your value or your worth to yourself, to other people, to God. I've got good news for you today. You don't have to do any of that. Not if you're in a relationship with Christ. And, and here's the thing. It is time for us to take something from the head le level and let it drop the 18 inches to the, the heart level. You know, we talk about being saved by grace through faith, and we get that as a concept and all this kind of stuff. But we need to, to experience at a heart level what it means to just rest in God's grace through Jesus Christ. Jesus is better. 
And he's better for, for so many reasons. Uh, one reason that Jesus is, is so much better is because you know, Jesus actually allows us to draw near to God. The Old Covenant didn't do that. We, we, because of the change that Jesus has, has made in the world and how we think about God, we almost take this for granted. We almost think of it as a self-evident truth that we can draw near to God. We pray to God all the time. You know, we're driving down the street and we enter into God's presence and, and so on. The idea of drawing near to God was an enormous break from the belief and practice of ancient Israel. You didn't do that. In the Old Testament, the Jewish people knew, as Stephen Cole notes, that you couldn't just stroll into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place in the temple of Jerusalem. I mean, if you think of the temple as a series of concentric circles, and it's the Holy of Holies is where God's name resides. It was where the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments was kept. And beyond that, there were you know, the courts of the priests, and only certain people could go here and here, and only women could go here, and only Gentiles here. And it was all about keeping as far away from possible as the presence of God. The Levitical system, the system of sacrifices in the Old Testament, was designed to keep worshipers at a distance from God. Only the, only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, and he could only do that once a year on the Day of Atonement. For the author of Hebrews to emphasize that we can actually draw near to God through Christ is a staggering concept, unprecedented, extraordinary. We take it for granted. In Jesus, we can draw near to God. I, that's still a staggering concept. As, as followers of Jesus, we can draw near to God. Jesus makes that possible. It makes it possible for us to, to go before the throne of the Father and speak with God, which is why, incidentally, this is why we pray in Jesus' name, because it's based on His credentials as the Son and our relationship with God through Him that we're able to draw near to God. The book of Hebrews talks about the importance of drawing near to God seven times, more than any place else in the New Testament. Hebrews 4.16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of God that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 7.25, you heard it just a moment ago, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives and makes intercession or prays for them. Hebrews 11.6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And don't miss the meaning of that. He's saying it's not your performance. It's without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who draws near to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. I, I love how John Piper puts it. I mean, he just nails this, I think. The great passion of this writer is that we draw near to God. That's what this book is about, that we come to his throne to find all the help that we need, that we come to him with confidence that he will reward us with all that he is for us in Jesus. The great aim of this writer is that we get near God, that we have fellowship with God, that we not settle for a Christian life at a distance from God, that God not be a distant thought, but a near and very present reality. You can draw near to God. We can draw near to God. Jesus made that possible. The Old, old Covenant couldn't do that. And this is one of the reasons that the author of Hebrews says that it's, it's useless that way. It kept people away. In the New Testament, God is no less awesome. God is no less holy. But now because of Jesus... This is why we were singing this morning, all because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, through Jesus, we can draw near. And what a gift. And let's not ever take that for granted. 
or assume it as a self-evident truth, lest we forget the incredible gift we've been given by God through Christ. Second reason the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is better in contrast to the old law, Jesus is able to save us completely. Hebrews 7.25 and 26, He is able to save completely those who come to God through Him because He always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Don't miss the point. The old covenant had no power to save people from sin. Does that mean it's useless? Absolutely not. Properly understood. It's useless for our salvation. It can't save us. The, the Old Testament had no power to save people from sin. What it did have the power to do, though, is to reveal sin to us and just make it evident in our lives. Um, you know, the Ten Commandments are great moral guidance for everyone, universally applicable. But as Jesus pointed out, you know, if we tease out the implications of the Ten Commandments, he says, it, it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you, whoever is even angry with a brother or sister has murdered them in their hearts. Who hasn't been angry with someone? Who hasn't coveted? You know, wanted something that belonged to someone else. The Old Covenant had no power to save people from sin. It has incredible power to reveal sin to us, though. This is what Paul's getting at when he writes in Galatians 3.24 that the law was our guardian until Christ came. Uh, other translations, our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, our tutor to lead us to Christ. Um, in the uh, Reformed tradition of which uh, we are a part, the Protestant Reformed tradition, um, people wanted to, uh, the theologians wanted people to understand the law um, still is relevant to our lives. But they also wanted us to understand that it is really relevant, but it is not going to save you. How is it relevant? There were three uses of the law in the, the Protestant Reformed tradition. First, to, just to show our need uh, for salvation. That if it all depends on us keeping all of the rules and being perfect, that none of us is going to make it. So to show our need for a Savior. Second use of the law was, uh, was according to Calvin, to restrain certain people from evil. Because, you know, if there weren't fear of punishment, some people just do whatever. What about Christians? Third use of the law for Christians, it's just to guide us and to encourage us in the way of living. You know, the, the moral law in the Old Testament still is applicable to us. We just know it doesn't save us, but we do know that what it teaches kind of shows the way of, of what we can now do out of love and out of a sense of gratitude, having been saved by grace through faith, shows us how to be good people. Jesus, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Now, completely, when it says save completely, completely means in every way possible, and completely means forever. Jesus' ministry is permanent. Unlike the Old Testament priests who had to be replaced because they kept dying off, we all do. They have to be replaced. And even these priests during their lifetimes had to keep repeating the sacrifices over and over again. And they did these sacrifices in a representation of heaven 
called the temple or the tabernacle, not in, in heaven itself, but in its representation. Jesus is better with direct, unhampered access to the throne of God. And living eternally, Jesus is, we're told in Hebrews here, that Jesus is interceding. He's praying for us without ceasing. Isn't it, you ever get encouraged when you're going through a tough time and somebody says, you know, I've been praying for you. Isn't that great to hear? I got some amazing news for you. Jesus is praying for you. Right now. If you're not even a believer, Jesus is praying for you. Right now. And because of Jesus, we are forgiven. Because of Jesus, we can have eternal life. Because of Jesus, we are saved by grace through faith, not our performance. Because of Jesus, we are a new creation. Because of Jesus, we, listen to this, because of Jesus, we can get off the hamster wheel of self-justification that just spins and spins and spins and never ends. It just tires us out, but it doesn't move us an inch forward. Because of Jesus and, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, our faith isn't about our being perfect. And if there is a lick of perfectionism in your spirit, one of the things you need to do is release it because it is keeping you from experiencing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. It isn't about our being perfect. It is, though, about our being perfected. And it's interesting how we're perfected. It's not by trying harder. It is by surrendering to the work of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives. Relaxing in God's grace. Letting God take over. Being perfected as we learn to trust ourselves to the completed work of Jesus Christ and rest at last in God's grace. That's the meaning of this. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him. And listen again, the law couldn't do that. Perfectionism can't do that. Basing your life or somebody else's life, putting those expectations on yourself or others is not going to save anybody. It, it just makes stuff worse, frankly. Because it keeps us from experiencing grace, which is the, the only thing that really can transform a human life. The law could not do that because the law was not designed to do that. It wasn't designed to save you. And that's why Jesus is better. Third and finally, he is better because his sacrifice is perfect and complete. Holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. Exalted above the heavens, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of his people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all, it says, once and for all, when he offered himself. Under the Levitical system, the sacrificial system, there was no end ever, there would be no end to the sacrifices that priests would have to offer. And why is that? Because it couldn't save people from sin. All it could do is atone for them for a moment until we start committing more sins, which is when? Immediately after our previous ones have been atoned for. As soon as past sins were atoned for, fresh sins were committed, and that meant more blood would have to be shed. When Jesus dies on the cross, what does he say? Last words. It is finished. It's finished. What was he talking about? Well, one thing is, his work was finished. He completed the job that God the Father commissioned him to do. It's finished. I did it. That's not all, though. He was also saying, 
the need for any further sacrifice is finished. And he was saying that the price for our sins has been paid in full. That, that phrase, it is finished, is exactly what they used to stamp on loan documents in the ancient Near Eastern world. When people paid them off completely, it meant you don't have to keep paying this bill anymore. It's paid in full. It is finished. Now, there are a lot of people, and frankly, there are a lot of Christians who are included in this number, who might miss the meaning of those words once and for all. Because what, what it means when the author of Hebrews says once and for all, it means that everything that needs to be done for our salvation has been done by Jesus. It is finished. It is covered. Mission accomplished. When we talk about being saved by grace through faith, what it means is that all we have to do is to believe that Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient for our salvation. Now here's where it gets interesting. and This is why the Apostle Paul, by the way, wrote the whole book of Galatians. If you want to explore some of this a little bit more, read Galatians. Galatians 5.1, for freedom Christ has set, set us free. You know what was going on in the church in Galatia? There were a bunch of people that knew that they were saved, but they started going back. They were being seduced by the law. They were being drawn back into rule-based religion. Here's what we need to know. We're saved by grace through faith. That means Jesus' death on the cross is enough. Not Jesus' death on the cross plus how good you are. Not Jesus' death on the cross plus how hard you try. Not Jesus' death on the cross plus anything. Just Jesus' death on the cross is enough. It is finished. And we need to get that out of our heads and into our hearts so we will stop being so worrying and critical and judgmental and perfectionistic and just running around on that hamster wheel and missing the incredible gift that God has given us through Christ. Jesus' death on the cross puts an end to any any need for legalism, for perfectionism, for pride, imagining that we are somehow better than others, for guilt, shame, anxiety, religious posturing, pretense, hypocrisy, anger. It reveals how each of those things is, is rooted in rule-based religion, which is the exact opposite of grace. It's the opposite of grace. You know, I, I really first began to, um, to understand at kind of an um, emotional level, a personal level, uh, God's grace a little bit better. When I was in college, I was reading this book that had been um, assigned to us, and near the end of, of this one chapter in this book, the, the author wrote these words. He says, sometimes a wave of light breaks into our darkness. And it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted. You're accepted. Do not try to do anything now. Perhaps later you'll do much. Do not seek anything. Don't perform anything, don't intend anything, simply accept the fact that you are accepted. That is a brilliant way of talking about what it means to be saved by grace through faith. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, we experience grace. 
Why does the author of Hebrews write the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless? For the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Why is Jesus better? Because through him we can draw near to God and not have to stand at a diff distance or just think of God as a distant thought. Jesus is better because he is able to save us and save us completely. That's something the law couldn't do. It was never meant to do that. And how can Jesus save us? Because his sacrifice is perfect. It is complete. It is fully sufficient. It is finished. There's nothing to be added to what Jesus has done for you. As a matter of fact, any imagined additions on our part just subtracts from the gospel. We are saved by grace through faith. This is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. Jesus is better. Thanks be to God. And God bless you.